This is the Capture One Hangout. We're glad that you guys can join us for this event. My name is Rich Harrington. I am the publisher of Photo Focus, and we're glad that you guys can join us for the event. Uh, we are going to be taking a look at several things with Capture One today, but also this event is brought to you in part by the team over at Aftershoot. So thanks to the folks at Aftershoot, and we'll be taking a look at their product as well and all the great things it does. Our agenda today, we're going to be having a real world edit workflow, as well as some tips on shooting weddings. So thanks to our guest, Eric, who is joining us today, and I'll have him introduce himself here in just a moment. My name is Rich Harrington. I'm the publisher of photofocus.com. We're an educational website that puts out content every day about getting more done with photography. We have a collection of tips that are both inspiration and education. And uh, I've been publishing for many years. I've put 40 books out through many over the years about photography and video, and also get a chance to speak at industry events. Uh, so if you'd like to connect, feel free to reach out. And I'd like to welcome our guest, Eric. Eric, thank you for joining us today. You are both a, a working wedding photographer as well as an expert on Capture One. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure thing. Well, hi, Richard. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so um, my name's Eric. I feel like it's a um, intro at an AA meeting. Um, but uh, I am Eric. I'm a wedding Addicted photographer. Addicted to a career. That's really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Addicted to light. <laughs> uh, no. So I'm a wedding photographer. I've been shooting for about 10 years now. Prior to that, um, my background was in um, film and television, cinematography, things like that. So there's some interesting um, crossovers there with my uh, past life. Um, but yeah, my time in shooting weddings, um, I've, I've really, really loved. Um, it's, um, I've really enjoyed some wonderful experiences with um, some beautiful couples um, and I guess also I've had the, the pleasure to, um, for it to take me to some really interesting places, um, which is a real treat. And after COVID and, and a lot of us around the world being, um, housebound for a while, it, it's, um, it was actually really great just to have some time to reflect on my goodness, like at, here in Melbourne for a period of time, we couldn't leave five kilometers from our home. And, and there I was, you know, months prior, you know, traveling all around the world. And, um, that, that has been a real treat too. Um, but of course I love shooting weddings full stop. So it could be a few kilometers from my house here in Melbourne, or it could be, uh, in Kenya, both, both are fun. Um, so, uh, yeah. And I guess other than that, yeah, um, I have had the pleasure to, um, to talk a little bit at, at conferences and, and run workshops of my own. Um, and I guess, you know, maybe, uh, I guess my, my angle as such is that, um, I'm really passionate about the craft of photography and the importance of wedding photography and that it kind of almost transcends wedding is a little bit. It's more about, um, it just is capturing life that happens to be on a wedding day. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I'm really passionate. And, uh, and I guess, um, you know, any opportunity to speak like this, we can kind of, um, talk a little bit about that too, I guess. Um, but I'm also a capture one ambassador and I love, um, I love that piece of software and, and specifically in weddings, it's a little bit of a, uh, it's not very common to be a wedding photographer and use Capture One. Of course, there's plenty. They, they walk among us, but um, it's not the, the typical thing. Um, and so that's kind of fun to talk about too, because I think there's a whole lot of advantages to using Capture One over the yeah. obvious alternatives. Um, but yeah, that's probably me in a nutshell. Excellent. Well, we're going to have some great looks at workflow today and everything else. So we're glad that you can join us. For those that are joining us live, remember, you can ask your questions in the Q&A and chat. We'll weave those in as well. Eric, I've turned off screen sharing for me. You're welcome to start to share your screen or walk things through. But uh, would you like to start with the editing side, the pre-visualization side? Where would you like to start today? Well, maybe what I'll do, um, maybe what I'll do is I'm just going to flick through a few kind of portfolio images. Um, if we want to talk about those at all, we can, um, and then we can, and then we can zoom right back into, um, into things like aftershoot and into capture one from there. So let me just, um, let me just throw up some images for now. Um, so yeah, this is, this is, this is a bit of an eclectic bucket of images. So they're, they're kind of varied, um, a lot. So, you know, uh, always really guided by light, but like I mentioned earlier, this is like more of a, a journalistic kind of moment where we're doing portraits and run back in the rain. There's really not much to control as a photographer. It's more about capturing the moment. Um, uh, this could be an example. Actually, I did a little post on my Instagram yesterday about um, first looks and how first looks can be really great for a whole range of reasons, but can pose some challenges shooting in midday sun. And so, you know, various tricks up your sleeve to um, 
to kind of create some beautiful portraits in some of the more challenging lighting situations. Um, so yeah, this is using. You're leaning into your, your film and video background here. Well, of the concept of sort of mixed shade here, like you're in daylight, but you've stepped under a little bit of available cover, which gives you the best light at this time of day. Yeah. And I, and also, um, as well as that, using that harsh sun to, to give them a bit of backlight and separation from the background. But I did pop a bit of flash on them here too. Um, just an umbrella, um, to be able to get, get it done, um, get it quick. Um, uh, I really love the having, I, I I'm loving as a photographer, always learning more about light and something that, um, I started doing a few years ago, like when you have these different penny drop moments as a photographer was just not being afraid of hard light. Um, hard light is beautiful. And, um, I, there's two examples here actually. Um, and it's just, it's, um, to not be scared of it. I think sometimes, um, particularly in weddings, people can fall into their, into their safe zone. And a lot of that can be in portraiture, backlit, um, open shade, kind of safe, if you like, um, where, you know, we are allowed to take risks with lighting and, and, and play and experiment and explore. Um, this is an example of using off-camera flash to kind of mimic the sunset a little bit. Um, whether that passes uh, is is up to you. It doesn't really matter. Um, but, you know, you can kind of play around with that. If, if Mother Nature doesn't want to give you a nice sunset, you can kind of have a crack at making something yourself. Um, I love the shadows lighting. here on this one, nice and moody. Yeah, yeah. And again, I, here, here is like hard light, you know, um, brutal sun and then, and then something quite opposite, you know, and really taking a lot of inspiration from um, Renaissance art, you know, Rembrandt, Caravaggio, um, Chiaroscuro effects, um, things like that. And then the same bride, same day, completely different scenario in the very same room later that evening popping a, a beauty dish on her and, and doing a more kind of, I don't know, glam, classic fashion type thing. Um, now, I, I noticed you're again. mixing a lot of color styles together here and mixture of black and white, rich color, um, less color. Uh, are you finding that you change your style up to the client's desires or the location? Uh, I know that Capture One has some very powerful color grading tools with it, which I'm sure I'm looking forward to seeing you showing that later. Yeah. Um, but how are you locking in? When do you use black and white? When do you use rich color? When do you use a real natural look versus these more stylized looks? What dictates that for you? How do you reach that point? Uh, uh, quite a, uh, well, a few different things, but how do I boil it down? I think that, um, things like before you start shooting, talking to the couple, um, talking, getting to know them. Um, and I guess in a broad sense, getting to know them and interacting with them can guide things in a really vague sense, but also there's an opportunity to talk about, um, even the color palette of the wedding day. Um, and even that coming down to, location scouting for example like this shot here is is a couple uh in kenya they were in nairobi you wouldn't think to go to a under construction um freeway for the portrait session but in talking to the couple and and um and uh look, talking to them about their color palette and what they connected with with my style we decided collectively to to take some risks on location and as long as it's considered and I, I, then I think it, it can work. And, and for this shot here, it's obviously just a very simple portrait. It is a happy couple on their wedding day and, and they're gorgeous, but also, I don't know, I, I really like it. And I, and maybe there's a little bit of context for me of, of um, hiring a driver in Nairobi and, and going around to um, under construction freeways it was kind of a nice find this, this location, but I liked the color um, at the location with this really rich, rusty colored earth. And of course, then that then dictates the edit a little bit um, that you want to kind of lean into that. And I think, I guess a general comment is with my editing, while it can be really varied in um, saturated, um, low saturation, black and white, whatever it might be, it's really being dictated by what you're creating in camera, which is to do with preparation, which is to do with discussion and location scouting and all of those things. But when it comes to actually editing the photograph, it's being guided by what you've captured in camera. For example, um, this shot here, um, it's really photographing that 
mood, that environment, that that um, ethereal, magical location, and then massaging that and bringing that to life in the edit. Now, this isn't really about presets as such. It's more about um, uh, uh, layers and brushes and really kind of bringing that to life as much as you can. Something like this, for example, this is a location called Pink Hills, and um, it's a it's a it's a place here in, in Victoria. Um, but in the edit in Capture One, you can kind of try and uh, bring that out a little bit more, um, dictated by by the location and the photos that you make. Um, let me flick through a few others here. Um, Do the when when you have all of these vastly different locations, like the boat there versus the hill, do these things have personal meaning to the couple, or are you are they telling you about their life or the metaphors that drive you to some of these visuals? It's a combination. Um, you know, something like this was um, the, a, a wedding in the Philippines. And we had an opportunity at sunset to take one of these beautiful boats out um, at sunset um, to, to take portraits. Something that I do and was a real turning point in me developing my, my photography was this concept of pre-visualization. And so I always make a point, no matter where I'm shooting, whether it's here in the Philippines or whether it's in Egypt or whether it's around the corner in Melbourne, really taking the time to write down tangible shot notes, ideas that I want to try, concepts I want to try, even perhaps reminders for myself. I'm my biggest critic. And sometimes um, I might look at a wedding and go, oh, Eric, you idiot, you went, you, you, you went far down, too far down this rabbit hole, or or you forgot to do this. Things that no one else would notice, but Sometimes I'll write little reminders for myself um, on my, my shot notes as well. But, you know, for something like this, um, uh, you know, something that I did a bit more a few years ago, not so much now, but this the fun of uh, having a drone and being able to do this bird's eye perspective um, was a bit of an opportunity there. Having this boat, having a couple that kind of were up for something a little bit different and, um, and yeah, doing it. Because as much as we inspire ourselves photographically, um, which is very, very important, by the way, not looking at wedding photography, but looking at art outside of weddings that inspires you. Also, in the moment, a wedding is so fast paced, we're not going to magically come up with an incredible idea on the spot necessarily. Of course, that can happen. Uh, this shot here, well, that's an interesting shot too, but I was going to talk about this one here was um, this was the most simple uh, kind of holiday house rental where this groom was getting ready. And I just saw this little pocket of light that I put him in. And then in post, I've lengthened this, um, this kind of um, opening in the hallway. And to me, it all of a sudden makes it look something like out of Star Trek, like he's about to be beamed up or something. Um, so there's some, there's some ideas that can come to life in various ways. In the moment, like this, for example, this is this is quite an old shot of mine, actually, but um, it was kind of well received at the time. And this was literally just walking along in the forest and a groom picking up a little bird skull. And I'm like, show me. And and he kind of did that. And then you, you take it and afterwards you're like, oh, that's kind of cool that his wedding rings there. And, and maybe there's a, a, a some um, it's got impact. You can read into it how you will, but it's got impact in some form or another. Um so it's always different, always different. Um, but I, I'm a big believer in preparation, researching the location, considering what the light's going to be doing. And sometimes there's a little bit of magic that happens, like the horse looking at me while the bride and groom are looking in opposite directions, you know, and already having a bit of an idea that I'd place them between these. It's a simple shot, but there's, you know, I think if you put the work in, sometimes there's a little bit of magic that happens that helps you along the way. Um, now, with something like this, there's a lot of light in the scene. Uh, how much of that is stuff that you brought with you versus how much do you rely upon what's already there? This is beautifully lit with the silhouette. Did you just, you know, did you discover the location or did you create the location? It's always different. It's always different. And I think that's why, you know, the more that we consume art, 
look at light, study light and understand it, we have a whole lot of things at our disposal to, to make um, eye-catching photographs. Um, this, to, I'll go back to that shot, but this, for example, is literally me the day before going peacock blue key light, pink backlight, um, set it up at 7.15 after entrees is served and go away and do it. So this is exactly what I wrote down the day before and, um, and was just something that I wanted to try. Um, the, this shot here in Egypt, this was more in the moment. What it's a bit hard to see what you're looking at here, which is kind of half the fun of this shot, but this is just a couple on, on, uh, in Egypt at this location, um, uh, kind of right after the sun's passed over the horizon. So it's just a couple with the, uh, sun setting behind them. And so that is just captured in camera, just like a, a silhouette at sunset. And then this is more about playing in post-production going, how can I create a, a, a shot that encapsulates this destination wedding in Egypt? So this is where I just played. I played. Um, I, this photograph is actually just a close-up of a, a tomb that I visited earlier that day. Um, and I overlaid this in, in Photoshop. Um, it, it was really that simple and, and playing with the different overlay effects. I kind of tried the different ones and went, oh, this actually merges with the sunset sky beautifully. And we get this lovely blue gradient fall off and, and, um, and there's this wedge in the hieroglyphics that kind of allows the couple to kind of pop out a little bit. So that's it, that's a completely you know a, a completely different example to to some other stuff. Um, this uh, would be more of just understanding light. It's a very very simple classic portrait, but understanding that as they as we approach the shade, the light naturally falls off. Um, so they're going to pop out from the background because the the background's darkening off behind them. And then when you get in the edit letting that guide your edit rather than trying to change it to something else, go, all right, well, I want to enhance the fact that the background's subtly falling off and this wall's just kind of disappearing into the background and is kind of serving as a bit of a kind of leading line to them. Um, so yeah, something very different again. Um, uh, I, there was a one particular wedding where I set up a backdrop and a beauty dish and just handpicked guests from the reception said, Hey, can I just, can I borrow you for a sec? And just sat them down and talked to them and, and just um, kind of had this moment of kind of celebrating the, uh, the weird and wonderful guests that appear at weddings that sometimes we don't um, pay enough attention to or, or whatever it might be. Um, again, playing, you know, but people don't have to like this particular shot, but it's, um, you know, in the moment going, oh, I'm going to, you know, muck around with um some of the stuff I was looking at in photo books at the time and go, oh, I'm going to slow down this shutter speed. And this guy has a really cool kind of almost like chill stoic kind of energy and going, Oh, how can I, how can I put that into a photograph? I wouldn't take this same shot of someone else. It's this idea of connecting with the couple, understanding them and, and having a bit of a play along the way as well. You know, when you're editing the black and whites, I, I hope you can share one of your edit workflows today, but tell me a yeah. little bit about some of the things you're thinking about. You're, you're capturing in color, but when you go into post-processing, what are some of the things you're looking at before you do the conversion? Well, in terms of what would make me look push it, or do you pre-develop before you convert to black and white? Yeah. So no, I would tend to do, I do my edit in color. And then I would, um, if I, if it's not a shot where I'm like, this is definitely a black and white shot, um, which of course it's always different. I don't, and I don't think there's, while we can have some conventions, there is no rules with this stuff. And, and a good photograph will work in either uh, is another thing that I kind of believe. But um, so I'll always do the full edit in color. And then if I'm doubting what it should be, then I'll just uh, duplicate it um, like a virtual copy or a clone, I should say. Um, and then I'll slap my black and white on there and I can compare the two if I'm, if I'm doubting it. But there could be a moment, particularly something that's photojournalistic, for example. This I've happened to do in colour, but this is an example of something that would work very well in black and white because it's this classic photojournalistic moment. 
that it's about stripping away um, information with black and white and really bringing it down to what I consider an interesting moment that everyone's covering their faces with a fan. I kind of find it funny. Whereas, um, you know, a, a brightly colored um, Hindu ceremony, we've got so much color that we, we kind of need to see that, but there's going to be moments in that, in that ceremony. And there was where it, it's about, you know, those, those kind of punchy um, black and white moments as well. Um, as I'm scrolling through, I'm not seeing a lot of good examples, but I'm seeing a lot of shots that could be black and white. You know, this is another example of something that would definitely, as I say this now, probably be better in black and white um, because it's layers, it's photojournalism and just stripping down to a moment and giving it some impact. Um, let me see if I've got some uh, some black and white example. Well, I guess I did earlier. There's a, yeah, yeah, looked yeah, at a few that, black and whites. Great. Yeah, well, um, yeah, something like that is a is a is a classic example where you're wanting to strip everything away and focus on impact with with black and white there. Um, Very nice. Yeah. Anyway, let's take a little look at your your edit workflow now. And uh, yeah. do you want to start with the culling aspect or do you want to show some editing techniques and then show your culling, the, the way you approach culling second? What would be your approach? Well, look, um, I in after shoot, we can, yeah, we can go through from the beginning. Um, but yeah. because um, there's a, the, as you know, there's the, the kind of the rendering and processing in after shoot, I've basically just got one that's already run through. And no, I fine. and um and we can talk a little bit about that, and then I can show how that then translates to Capture One, which is really amazing, by the way, the the workflow um that we can do there. So what I'll do then, if you're cool with that, I'll jump over to um to Aftershoot, and we'll and just have you, a brief if you, chat. If you haven't upgraded, they just did an update. I, I was able to call a two thousand photo shoot in about six minutes, so they've amazing up the speed again. So. My goodness. They so certainly good. can call it faster than I can call it. Is all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, my goodness. Like, um, oh yeah, just uh, in in epic epic proportions. Um, this has been an absolute game changer. Um, so just go back one level here, so that we can tell people how you got these into aftershoot. So just go back to your album view. And sure. So yeah. Folks, it's, it's super simple. You'll just on the albums page click that you want a new album, and then you just add your pictures with the add folder. And then it basically is just a set of simple rules and you'll just tell it your tolerance for how much focus you need in a picture and how many selects you would like. And so what Aftershoot does is it's able to identify the best picture in every group. So it doesn't just identify your best photos, that's what it actually calls its sneak previews of ones that are going to score best with social media and sharing. But what it's able to do when you actually start the culling uh, after you add them all in. So yeah, so he just added a, a small folder here. If you click on start culling, it allows you to set your rules. And this is where you can tell it how to group and organize. So maybe you just want to show this part and then we can go into the uh, a real shoot, a full one. Yeah, so yeah sure cool. thing. Yep. Yeah, so what I've done here is just select a, a very small amount of images just to bring in to 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 kind of um, represent what you're what you're explaining now. So we can jump back to another project, but as you've described, what I've done here is just import a bunch of images. Now this would obviously be the full collection of images that you photographed on a shoot, um, and these are worth familiarizing yourself with um, because they do make quite a quite a big difference. Now, you know. The, the developers have done a great job here because they've really held your hand explaining what these things are. We don't necessarily need to go through them in detail right now, but familiarize yourself with them. As a wedding photographer and, and as a wedding photographer that shoots between um, six to 8,000 images a day, typically, um, I want to I want to work this this guy pretty hard. I want to I want to make it work for it. So I'm saying, you know, um, culling blurred photos, I want it to strictly do that. Um, I want it to um, it group photos into the same sequence in the most yeah. extreme way possible. Um, so the, the, the first three of those, what that does is looks for pictures within shot within 30 seconds of each other and extreme ignores the time constraints and just looks for pictures that are similar. So in your case, you're doing a lot of posed shots. You probably want the extreme grouping to pull it together. But if you were shooting journalistically and a lot of shots, then strict would probably be enough to pull them into lots of sets. 
but extreme is really going to collate it down to just the, you know, putting the maximum number of photos together. And what Aftershoot is looking for is the best one or two within that group, which is what that next set of selections is, is how much would you like to pull? How many exactly. what percentage do you want? Yeah. And so here for me, for example, as you said, as someone like in the portrait session, for example, I could fire off 50 shots of the exact same shot. So I really do want it to be in that situation. As you described, it's going to be different for everyone. Even as a wedding photographer, you're going to shoot slightly different from one person to the next. Um, and, and, and these are not locked in stone. So if you guys color shoot and you you want less or more, you can recall and it, it just takes a, like 30 seconds to two minutes because it doesn't have to analyze it again. It just reprocesses the AI analysis and gives you new results. So you can recall very quickly. Sure thing. And yeah, so with, when it does um, put images into a set, as we've specified above, here is now how many um, how many selections do you want us to make within that um, it, within that set? So for me, I, I set it to moderate because I want to see a few different variations of that sequence to make sure that I'm grabbing the right one or two or three um, to then edit and deliver to the couple. Um, the sneak previews, um, I love this piece of software and I won't say anything negatively about it other than I find for me, this isn't particularly helpful at this point in time, but I think it's great that it's there and it's of course only going to improve. Um, and what that's designed for is it's a subset of the main call. So the sneak previews is a smaller collection of the five-star images and what it's doing is identifying the ones that it feels are going to do best on social media. So it's specifically a focus on uh, what will score best on social media um, in a general sense. So it sometimes favors humorous portraits or sometimes a little bit uh, attention grabbing. So it's just a subset, but you don't have to pull those. That's why there's also a none option there, but it's yep. a further reduction. And so for a lot of folks, it works well. For others, you know, you have a very clear, distinct style. So you're going to know what you're going to want to post for your audience, but it can be a nice way to just call down a collection of behind the scenes photos, for example. Yeah, sure thing. And when you think about the the amazing technology that a piece of software like this uses, finding blurred photos, finding duplicate photos, um, finding out of focus photos, um, uh, you can you can just in your common sense you can imagine that machine learning would be able to do that. Now, what something like this is trying to do with machine learning is really taking that to the extreme of of, of making an assessment like a human being would make and go, this is a good photo, this is a good photo completely aside from the technical aspects. So, it, you know, that's uh, it's a tall order at this point, and I think it's fantastic, and, I, and I'm excited to see that develop more. Um, uh, this okay. is a, under the advanced tab. There's some options to uh, to toggle some of these on and off, but, of course, you know, we, we generally want to use them all. Yeah, I like the closed eye detection, unless you're, like, photographing infants who always have their eyes closed. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and you can see that that's being improved over time with the closed eye detection because in portraiture, sometimes we might have um, someone with their eyes closed on purpose, whether we've posed them that way, whether they're crying, whether they're laughing. You know, there's a lot of reasons people can have closed eyes as opposed to just blinking. Um, and if it's before, uh, you, before you import, then the opportunity here is it will add this as either color labels, stars, or keywords. So that's up to you. And you can decide what those look like. Or if you've already imported, then you have control over whether or not it overwrites things. So if you've already brought stuff into Lightroom or Capture One, you could say, don't change my stars or color labels, just add new keywords and you can search on those. Or if it's before you import, then it's useful. I see you've already customized the star rating system to match your style of stars. Exactly. And, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to, to showing you guys how this then translates into Capture One. So it is worth, um, I, it, it's natural when someone might start using this that they just accept the defaults, which is absolutely fine. Um, but once you start thinking about your workflow, you'll inevitably have a, a way that you prefer this system to work. Um, and you you don't, you can only use one of these columns uh you know, as, as you desire. Um, I, I use all of them and I kind of have different reasons for that. But um, yeah, for me, 
the selected and sneak peeks I keep as the same color label because green for me is, yes, this is a photo that I'm going to edit and deliver to the couple. Um, and then I've used the star ratings in terms of the colors, like is the photo, I'm, am I going to edit this photo or not? Yes or no? Yes. Um, and then I can go through and be picking my favorites. So while Aftershoot might have a, have a try at making sneak peeks, once I'm in the edit in Capture One, I can be adding my star ratings um, as well. Mm -hmm. That'll make a bit more sense later. And, and I like how you're using that. You're saying if it's blurred, red's a no-go, and closed eyes are like a traffic light. I got to look at it and decide, right? Yes, exactly. The, yes, this <laughs> is very logical. I, I, like, I like your use yeah, of I, labels. That's very smart. I, uh, I overthink things and, uh, <laughs> and I appreciate you noticing my geekery. Um, so we've got the settings I, here. I <laughs> yeah, cool. I like it. I like it. I'm not so crazy after all. So we're going to hit start culling now. Now this is a, this just happens to be a bunch of raws that was a preview selection for a couple. So um, these are all pretty much images that I ended up editing and delivering. So it might not actually pick up a whole lot here. But this is where we can jump across to perhaps my other projects. Um, but as we can see, we've got 18 images in total. It's detected one um, with closed eyes. Well, as it's as it's kind of still thinking here. So that's that's kind of the assessments it's made. And then we can go through in these quick filters and see, um, uh, you know, closed eyes. Let's have a look at it. Um, I, um, and we can see her, she's looking back and smiling and, and kind of, it, that's kind of almost considered it a blink, which is fine. We won't get upset at them for that. Um, it's just, that's where we need to be mindful in our workflow to re be reviewing these assessments that are being made here. Um, but, you know, the, we're, we're putting it under, under a test here because these are all the images that I've actually, you know, like and giving yeah. to the couple. So let's go, jump go across. Ahead and show us the real, go ahead and show us like a real shoot where you have not 8,000, but you've got quite a few there. Yeah. So this is an edit, an edit I just completed only a few days ago. Um, and this is an example of why this piece of software literally just changes my life because um, I can go through and spit in 5,769 Im Im images and then be virtually straight away getting that down to an amount of images that while importantly, I must check, I, uh, I, I really do need to, it, yeah, I think you really owe it to yourself to be reviewing these assessments that are being made. What an incredible starting point that is um, to, to do that. So there's a few different ways you can you can go about once you've run the cull, how you go about doing it. Um, and it really doesn't matter what order you do it in, but it's worth having a quick glance at these at some point. So for example, it's gone, all right, well, all of these images are blurry. And um, it could be that you've intentionally used a slow shutter speed, that it's made a miscalculation for whatever reason. Um, so you just want to be reviewing these things. Um, I think my source images are disconnected, but I don't think that'll affect too much what we're doing here. Yep. And, and you can pull um, anything out of this by just hitting, uh, you can ch manually change the star rating, or you can use the A key to add it to the selection and that will promote it to selected. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point is that before people actually open these pieces, this kind of software for the first time, there's a fear that, oh, it's going to delete images for me, which of course it's not doing. It's just applying a, a rating, a, a tag or a rating or a keyword or, or all of the above. So, you know, you know, it's really up to us to review them and make sure that we're happy. Um, closed eyes, especially um, because there is a lot of reasons for people to have closed eyes. Um, um, that we might want to, um, yeah, to review and check. Um, so they're worth reviewing at some point. But then when you're actually going to do the, the to review the cull, um, you can do it in a few different ways. Um, and I've got, I, I have made this window smaller so you guys can see it a little bit more on Zoom. But um, I do quite like reviewing in this kind of grid view um, and, and um, looking at them this way. Um, but what we're looking at here um, is, for example, this guy here is gone. All right, well, we'll let let's let's tag this image. Yes, you want this image, but also just so you know, there's nine or more similar images that have been detected. So when we click on that, we're seeing here in this view that um, that's a manual adjustment that I've made where I've un unselected that. 
Um, but it's gone through again. My image is disconnected, so it might misbehave a little bit here. Yep. But you won't see the full screen preview here because you don't have the full images on your system. But that's okay. You can still call even without them. Yes, exactly. Yep. Um, and like I say, I, I think I think we can probably cover off what it's doing here pretty briefly, and then and then jump over to Capture One where we can okay. see what AfterShoot's done in the background. But um, so yeah, as you can see, how what a crazy person I am doing like thirty eight um, you know variations of the same shot. And then I'm going in the edit, I want to add a few more. So I've gone through because there's a lot of little moments with the bridesmaids here laughing and expressions, having a few variations of that. Um, Are you shooting when you, I see that that was fairly consistent with the number. Are you shooting those under sort of an auto sequence or are you, are you manually triggering at different moments? How are you deciding or do you just kind of let them engage and you're talking to them and you're just capturing in a burst? Exactly. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's trying to capture and anticipate that right expression and right moment for something like this. Um, when I can actually bring up the images properly, I might even have a little prompt or an activity for them to do where I'm, I'm setting up moments to happen. Um, it could be, um, for example, um, you know, let's say one of the bridesmaids went through high school with the bride and go, what was something really annoying about her in high school? Like what, what drove you crazy about her? Like almost like, uh, the airing of grievances in Festivus in Seinfeld, if anyone gets my <laughs> reference out there, the, the airing of grievances, or uh, it could just be like words to describe her, or it could be something more heartfelt and sweet, like what what's what's your favorite thing about this person? And so you're creating moments to happen. So everything is there playing out, and then you're there, and all you got to do is click the button. But even then, I yes, I guess you could just do a burst where you're just like shooting the whole thing. But what I try to do is just kind of go like to catch it perfectly where that one person's laughing hysterically looking that way or one person's leaning over and looking and you can kind of get that beautiful moment there. So when we're ready to do the handoff, there's two things we can do. We can um, save this, you know, we save the project in Aftershoot and there's a, a command to update the existing XMP. So if you'd already imported the photos, you can go up to the top menu, which you're not sharing, but it's basically under the file menu, you can rewrite the XMP. So if you'd already imported a project and set it up in Capture One or Lightroom and you needed to update the existing photos, you can do that by updating the folder and then Capture One will rescan and see that. Or if you haven't imported, if you do things in the recommended order, doing after shoot before Capture One, you just click the export button, it's gonna do a clean handoff, right? Yeah, and and the way that I've done it, I, I've tried um, the the export method where you're um, you can in, in my older workflow, I would get all the images that are what I call my selects, and I would literally transfer them into another folder. So AfterShoot can assist you with doing that, whether you move or copy the images that you've selected into another folder. Um, I'm doing something a little different now, which is um, which is kind of cool, and I can show you as well, which is relating to the tags that are being applied in Aftershoot and how they you can um, kind of um, do a bit of a handshake with Capture One so that these assessments flow through. So let's go ahead and, um, and I'll show you that. So I'm just going to change over to a Capture One project here, um, which is that same project actually, which is helpful. Um, let me just make sure I've got the right one selected here. Okay. Um, so just getting my interface here a little bit tidier. Um, okay, so in a session, you can create um, these uh, session albums. And the beauty is here that you can make these albums the exact same terminology and color ratings that Aftershoot is applying. So um, here, for example, I've created a session album called Blurred and I've put in brackets red because that is what it's referring to when we look at the smart album. So here it's saying, if you have a color tag that is red, then you appear in this folder. And you could go down to filters and select red, but in terms of a, a workflow where you can just look at it and see it, go, oh, I want to look at my blurred images. Here they all are. These are these are the images that Aftershoot have determined as being blurred. One of the benefits of doing it this way, as opposed to what I would previously do, which is transfer the selects into a different folder and only import those, 
is that anything that you might miss or think of while you're doing the edit, you can quickly just go, oh, I'm going to review my blurred images and go, oh, I think there was actually a good shot that that wasn't in, um, that wasn't selected. And I can go through and I can just change my rating to green by hitting, um, for me, it's the number six and it disappears. Why does it disappear? Because it's no longer in this collection and it's going to be in my selects folder and it will be over here. So I found this absolutely brilliant and the and to really pair up how Aftershoot and Capture One can work together really efficiently, this has been a, a game changer. Now, there's a few things that um, if you are to do this, um, a few quick tips. Now, you could spend a lot of time talking about this in of itself, but um, importantly, you can create session templates and that that's the key. And, and maybe while we don't necessarily want to go into that in any great detail right now, um, it's worth um, keeping that in mind that these can be pre-populated and saved as a template. So when I, for when I create a new session, a new wedding, I have my wedding template. And when I do that, it means that these will all magically appear. Um, so otherwise, you would have to do it manually each bunch, time. You have a bunch of empty albums ready to populate that are part of your new Capture One session. For those that haven't tried sessions, a lot of folks just think of putting everything in one super catalog, but in, in your world where you're shooting for couples, you wouldn't want the, the gaff of mixing up wedding parties or ending up with mixed photos together from two different jobs. So it's really important to keep those as separate and discrete elements. And that's the sessions workflow. It's a bunch of basically micro catalogs in a way, right? Absolutely. And, um, and I must confess, I was quite stubborn um, using previous software, which of course we all know what that is, before I changed to Capture One, um, I I really, my workflow was so engineered on a, on a catalog kind of mindset. Um, and so I really had to push through um, and really go, all right, I know sessions are made for what I do. I know that a session is for an individual job that does, as you said, doesn't need to be linked to, to a master catalog of, of all multiple images. So um, it did take me a while to embrace and get my head around why I should be doing it this way. And oh my goodness, since doing it, there is so, so many benefits um, that, that we could we could touch on um, on today briefly. But um, uh, like I'm jumping ahead here, but exporting, for example, like a one-click export of all my different image sizes um, all spit out into correctly named folders using tokens and all this kind of stuff. It is, it's, it just cut hours and hours and hours out of my workflow by going, okay, the edit is complete, tick a few boxes, hit export and walk away. And then I come back and the images are in the right client folder, in the right subfolders, correctly named. It's a thing of beauty. So well, I, um, think, I think what you've hit upon here, both with your with your aftershoot workflow and your, your export recipes workflow is that no photographer lands new business from just their culling or just their exporting, but those are very time consuming tasks. So it's not that you don't still review the results as a real human before you hit send, but that's a lot faster than having to do things the manual way, giving you more time to return calls to customers, giving you more time to have FaceTime with the customers or spend a little more time when you're getting back in front of them to talk. Uh, I think it gives you more time for the business side of your things as opposed, you know, and actually more time for shooting too, right? Indeed. And, um, and, and also if we're talking about post-production, even just editing images, I can be spending more time um, uh, working on an edit knowing that yes. as soon as I finish this, and I did working on this edit literally only, only a day or two ago, it's like I know now today as I'm editing, when I've finished editing images, I can click a few tick boxes and walk away. Whereas a few months ago using a different workflow or using other software, there is a whole big time commitment of going, oh, I'm going to run this action in Photoshop or I'm going to have to wait for this to export in Lightroom and then run the other one and the other one and the other one. Um, so I can even just from it, you're absolutely correct, obviously, with just having that time on your hands. But even when it comes down to the edit, I can go, oh, you know what, I'm going to, uh, here's a little before and after here. You know, that's that's what it was, and that's what it what what I edited it to. 
And there's, a, there's using, a little- Are you using some of the layering features inside of Capture One here? So it looks like you're, yeah, you are using layers. So talk a little bit about that just conceptually, you know, this is still a non-destructive image editor, but you're using a layers-based approach, which you couldn't do inside of an Adobe uh, cataloging tool. Yeah, correct. And so, um, yeah, there's a few things to kind of comment on here. Um, one kind of links back to what we talked about earlier in our chats is talking to the couple, talking about that they were interested in doing a first look, that, um, that in doing a first look can be great, from a logistical point of view, but can pose some challenges with shooting in midday sun and then going, all right, well, would you be open to heading to an indoor location um, and, and things like that? And, um, you know, then you start to jam on location ideas and then I find myself at a great location, which we've lined up and walking around that in the days prior, looking at light, looking at places, looking at and, and going, okay, well, we can shoot here. And, oh, isn't that interesting that the 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 window is up really high and casts um, some light onto the floor um, and then going, oh, but if they're standing up, they'll kind of have the window behind them. So can I try like sitting them down? And um, and then I wonder if um, because the light will be really toppy, I wonder if it's not so much about their faces, but more creating an interesting shape. All these things are kind of pre-visualized and things. And then so that's all in mind. But then when you take a photo, it could be like that. So I added a bit of right. smoke, which turned out to not really help the photograph too much. Um, but th there's an idea that's there in camera, bit of paint. It was a very rustic kind of room. So it's a bit of paint coming off the walls and stuff. So it's not about changing the image. It's about executing what the idea was in the first place, which for this shot, again, you, you don't have to like it. It's it's it, but that was the idea. Um, and yeah, so I think, I, I think what yeah. I'm seeing with your work here that that bears emphasis to those who are, you know, trying to wrap their head around the approach, you have to get the composition and the emotion right in camera. But yeah. with the flexibility we now have with these raw files in, you know, 10 bit, 12 bit, even 14 bits of color that, you know, what people don't realize is, is that, you know, when you went from a 8-bit JPEG to a 10-bit RAW, well, that was four times more light information. So now we are into a 12-bit RAW. Well, that's 16 times more information about the light than we had with the JPEG. And now we're getting 14-bit RAW. You know, that's insane. That's 64 times more information than you ever had in a JPEG. The light is yours to manipulate. And whether you take the time to do it purely in camera or a combination where you take what was there in the scene and then you emphasize it more with this painting of light that you're doing here i think it's good for people to see just how much that light that image changes from in camera to delivery but it still looks natural because it's not just a bad paint effect you're just really adjusting the light after the fact by pushing and pulling rather than painting I guess. Yes. And I guess um, additionally to what you said is that you, if you don't see that light in camera in that moment, you won't see it in post either. So everything that I, I've got here in this sequence, while the original file might be vastly different in some ways or be unedited, it's really mm -hmm specifically honing in on that light specifically knowing that if she looks straight to him then her eyes will be in shadow and that that isn't you can't really bring that to life too much in the edit so knowing that we need to kind of catch her eyes up a little bit higher so we can do so much with our files and we can change the look of an image entirely but if you're not tuned in to finding light using light, playing with light, and really being mindful of when you click that button, what light you're capturing. While you can change the file entirely, I don't think you'll learn and understand light and really know that you can even do that with your file, if that if that makes right. any sense. It, it's, it's a lot like cooking. You, you still need to know what you want to accomplish, and you still have to have high quality ingredients and show care in making those selections. But know that... It is another it is another part of the creative process. So here 
you focus on everything that was right, but I love how you're bringing a more luminescent feel and that's tapping into. And, and what I think people forget is that this used to happen sort of chemically in, in the film stock. And now we don't have those characteristics in the digital sensor, but instead they become part of the post-processing process as you assign camera profiles and gamma ranges and curves that that's what you would have done with film stock selection before. Now it's a part of the post step. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And I'm so glad you touched on that because I think there's so much to learn from. It was kind of convenient in a way as a film photographer that you were locked into certain presets being the different film stocks that you used and you needed to be mindful and very intentional about what film stock you're using for what purpose not just the speed of the film, but the curve and the, and the, the, the character and the, and the, the color qualities and, and the contrast and, um, and all of those kind of different elements. So I, I entirely agree with you. And I think to apply that philosophy to your digital photography can be exceptionally helpful of going, all right, so we've got a flat raw file and then what character are we, are we giving that? Um, I think is a really, really good way to approach it because it then honors what you've captured in camera, much like shooting on film. And it means that you can also know that you're not um, going overboard either. I think if you're looking at editing as massaging what you created in camera and then applying some uh, nuanced kind of characterization and aesthetic to your images, that's really all you need to do. Um, and some images might require nothing at all. Uh, and then like some of those examples earlier where it's really emphasizing a pool of light and, and reducing distraction. Yeah. You can spend a bit of time um, adding various layers and darkening certain areas and lightening certain layers, um, et cetera. Very nice. Eric, we've got a few min minutes left. Is there an edit that you'd like to show or a, a favorite thing inside of capture one that you've fallen in love with that you'd like to share with others? I'm sure I do. Uh, let me think here. I've got some other, catalogs open here um well you mentioned about the color editor so we can talk a little bit about that um i wonder which there's a few images here i can talk about there um there's another example of having like a gazillion kind of layers there which you wouldn't even really necessarily see um by looking at the image that i've spent a bit of time doing a few different things there that's really just bringing to life what's there but it's amazing all the little tweaks that you can do to just um draw the eye in on onto uh, what you're wanting them to look at you know um so this image here talking about the dress and the shoes and the idea that you can do mm -hmm. a brush just on though that area and on that area and you can go i want that to be a little bit more saturated in the shoe i want the hue of this dress to be a little bit more blue um, and make those adjustments. Um, but yeah, like another example of color and how it translates from conceptualization right through to the edit. Here, for example, uh, uh, there is a, we, we knew red was our color for the day. Um, there is going to a location where we knew there was this neon. Um, I added some additional red light behind the couple um, to enhance the uh, it's called motivated lighting in cinematography um so to create an additional red light um onto the couple to enhance that look and then and did you there's pass a little bit the of person on the scooter or did that just happen because the creative serendipity there is wonderful and i think that's the point is that if you do those things then sometimes you just got to be ready to capture a bit of magic i mean I didn't, we didn't talk to that person on that scooter at all. And, um, that was a bit of serendipity, but isn't that amazing? Again, we don't need to talk yeah. about the, if the photo is remarkable or not, that's not what we're talking about right now. It's this idea that, okay, talking to the couple, thinking about color, color notes, what, what's going to come through in the wedding. Okay. Well then will we go to this location. We're going to add this additional light behind the couple artificially um, and then we're going to take their photo and then, oh my goodness, something, someone's coming past in a red scooter. This is perfect. 
it's also a bit of a funny thing. saying you're going in the right direction let me help yeah. you. yeah <laughs> and it's a funny thing here in melbourne because they've just rolled these out um and everyone hates them and the you know us crazy aussies are well i say us i'm not doing it but crazy aussies are throwing them into the river and there it's kind of turning to be a bit of a problem but it, so it's a bit of a, a funny point at the moment but also in the edit what do we do well uh, I changed the hue and saturation of this scooter to to kind of fold it in to the to the photograph a bit more, um, and yeah, so it's that it it is an entire process from start to finish. But um, yeah, it's nice when you do those things. I feel like maybe on a spiritual level, the universe can reward you sometimes, much like that shot earlier of the tourists walking mm -hmm. past in uh, in Montenegro. Um, some other images um, to, to talk about some other things would be, uh, I'll, and I'll make sure my screen sharing is right this time. So I'm gonna change this over now. In terms of massaging what's there um, and taking the time to do that, I think this one in particular was, it was an interesting before and after. So Again, preparation, talking to the couple, location scouting. This couple were married at a gorgeous venue um, out in the country, manicured gardens and things like that. It was pretty. But on my location scout, there was a, it was very, very cinematic. There was a really flat landscape. And up on the hill was this kind of pine forest with a cemetery. It was like it was something out of, a, out of a movie. It was incredible. And I'm like, well, I don't necessarily want to take him to the cemetery, but We'll do the portrait session at the venue. That's where they've chosen and it'll be beautiful. But if I can get them away at sunset, we could we could go to this forest. And they really were a little bit hesitant um, because they're trying to balance enjoying their wedding and, and um, being with guests and things like that. So I didn't want to steal them away for too long. So it's about building a relationship and a rapport and trust, location scouting, considering light, looking at the sunset time. And all those things, like they do, they do pay off. And and um, so, but yeah, here for example, um, in terms of massaging what's there, like that was the before, and I feel like that's a really interesting example because here in this file, the light is beautiful, but it's really, um, it really needs to be reined in. That sky is is really taking off because it was after the sun had passed the horizon. So this is like yeah. residual kind of sunset light here with still a bright sky and then going, you know, you, you could almost not even include this image in your cull because of the, the issues there. And then going, no, but there's something here and understanding light and knowing what you can do with it. Um, I, I personally really, really love this shot. Um, yeah. And you, you, um, you did a nice job there of just thinking through, you know, the intensities of where does the eye go? And you took what was the most dominant area and recessed it so it was even with the rest of the foreground. And now our eye is drawn to the couple, but it's a beautiful frame around them. And I love how you evened out the luminance level of the sky versus the field. Yeah, and and to not do so, because you can overdo it as well. You can, um, I, I'm not sure, I hope that when you look at this image, it doesn't look like it's been crazy crazy edited like the sky the tones it, it can be quite difficult to no, do it actually it looks like you really... waited for the perfect sky and then had to schlep 15 lights out to light the couple instead of yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so um so i feel like that's an interesting example there um and you know th this shoot in general kind of just worked out quite nicely um uh here is an example of um luma luma range and i think i've got that Hmm, which layer is it? Um, let me just check here because I do, I might be able to kind of demonstrate this real quick uh, when I find the right layer. I don't label my layers because I'm just editing and moving on. I couldn't possibly spend the time labeling them, but it means when I do go back like this, um, I'm just going to create a new layer to show you um, what I'm talking about here. So um, I'm going to use my, I've got a few shortcuts here. So bear with me as I do this. Um, so I've got, uh, a shortcut sh set up to show me the mask. But what I want to demonstrate here, which I've already probably done on another layer, it, but I won't go through and waste everyone's time finding it, is I don't want to darken the tree trunks. I don't want to darken the foliage. I just want to darken the sky in this frame. So a way we can do that is um, I've just done a gradient here 
and I can do um, an initial exposure adjustment just to kind of, um, uh, well, in fact, no, I might go, um, I might go highlights um, and we can see, or just drag them right down. I'm going to really overcook it and uh, I'll, let's even go that far. So it just looks completely ridiculous at this point. With Luma range, we can go through and we can dial this in so that I'm going to hit display mask. And what it's going to start doing is only applying adjustment to a certain luminance range. So I want to flatten it off at the top and I want to kind of dial this in. Now, probably because I've already applied this on a layer underneath somewhere, um, it, we might not, uh, let's not spend the time dialing this but in. You can perfectly. drag out that, that bottom handle on the left just to create a smoother transition too. Yeah, right? sure. Um, and oh, yeah, you can see here that it's it's grabbing onto those highlights and yeah, we could spend the time dialing that in and and, and kind of getting that right. Um, but, you know, let's let's accept that for now. And then um, when if I bring up, and you can see there the effect that it's having, I can hit M to, for my mask. And then I'm going to go through and I'm going to just make sure that the couple isn't selected in any way, um, which is doing that. And then we can, I can toggle my mask off and then I can, um, and then I can go through and fine tune those adjustments yeah. so that it's not overcooked, which will be overcooked now because I've already done this on, on a layer underneath, but well, it's these a are, really, these are, great, these are great tips. And I, I, we're, we're at the end of our window, but I wanted to emphasize here you've really done a wonderful job of understanding your goals for light and translating that into both the shoot and the actual edit. And, and it's really wonderful to see you using layers like this because a lot of people think of layers as a special effect tool or for compositing and they don't realize that a layer is kind of like adding another light to a shoot or adding a modifier. Like each layer is like a a diffuser, a reflector, a second light. It's just letting you add something that you didn't add while shooting or control what you had while shooting. Let me refine it this way. Exactly. And, and you talked about in regards to editing philosophy and, and um, looking back to um, generations before us with um, film photography, what we're doing here in the edit digitally on Capture One is what Ansel Adams did making prints in the dark room. This is, this is exactly the same philosophy. You look at, um, you know, Snake River uh, or something like that, and it's, it's about him being at the perfect place at the perfect time with the perfect light and, and getting that in frame and then having a negative that will allow him to extract that drama and draw focus and, and um, you know, darken the clouds and, and use all this wonderful um, printmaking process. We're just doing, or at least how I look at it, is doing exactly the same thing. Um, so we still have a lot to learn um, from from the great photographers um, in terms of uh, drawing from that film philosophy. Because the danger in digital is that there is too much at our disposal that we can do anything with our images. You know, we could, if we would continue talking, I use a bit of AI for retouching. There's but then you can also drop in a rainbow or drop in a, a completely different sky, you know, that we can do anything. Um, but if we're to make beautiful images, I think that there's a lot we can always refer back to um, with the with the foundations of film photography down from, you know, in every sense of the word. But yeah. yeah and, I'm, and I'm glad you've shown, you know, I, I, I use AI for a lot of my things, but I use just the right amount of it. And so, you know, what you've shown here is a wonderful restraint of using technology to accelerate your workflow, but not compromising on your vision or your goals. I love how you put these together. Indeed. Well, I, I really appreciate your kind words. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, let me just um, give a couple of, let me just share really quickly my screen and then yep. we will wrap up here. One second. So Thank you guys to those of you who've watched our replay and those of you who are able to join us live, we appreciate it. This has been a Capture One Hangout and the replay is available over at photofocus.com. And uh, thanks over to the folks at Aftershoot. The whole goal behind Aftershoot is it's gonna speed up the uh, your workflow by letting you spend time on the other parts of photography that are more fun and interesting. So Aftershoot's gonna allow you to really speed up the culling and selection process. And it doesn't throw away any of your images, as Ronald mentioned, as Eric mentioned, I should say. Uh, but what it does is it highlights and identifies similar images and images that should be likely not used. So you can focus on the ones that do need your attention. So 
Aftershoot's available. The free version will take care of automatically identifying key things and find the closed eyes and the blurred photos. And then the pro version adds the ability to uh, find duplicates and also go in and uh, do some additional options for culling and automation. So you can check that out. Uh, if you want to learn more or see the replays of other past events, you can check out photofocus.com. And Eric, thank you for joining us. And I want to make sure I got your URL correct, right? That, that is, is correct. URL. And um, and on Instagram uh, is Eric Ronald Photo. So find me on Insta. And, and if you want to connect and ask me questions or, or pick my brain, feel free. I'd love to connect with anyone that has watched this today. Excellent. Well, and uh, most of our replay, most of our views these days are going to be on the replays. So for those of you watching it as well, still free to do that and be great to connect. All right. Well, Eric, thank you so much for joining us for the event today and for sharing your knowledge. We appreciate it. Absolute pleasure, Richard. Thanks so much. Thanks. Good day, everyone.